Hello, hello, and welcome to the USV Brown Bag. Um, tonight we'll be talking virtualizing exchange. Um, I'm your host, John Harris, and tonight we're going to have uh, Matt Leibowitz on. You can catch him at uh, Matt Leibowitz and Joe Holger um, at Joe Holger. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, so things that are going on. So we got VMworld just around the corner, and there's there's several different things going on there. You know, around VMworld, right before it, that type of thing. So this year we've actually got a new thing going on with the VM Underground folks. They're doing a thing called Opening Acts, and so Opening Acts is it's a really cool concept. It's basically group panel discussions, right? So what we did is we they went out and they pulled the community and said, hey, you know, these are some topics that you know, here's some topics. What do you want to hear about? Who you, who do you want to hear from? And things of that sort. And um, so what we've done is uh, we have that going on. It's the day before VMworld. It's on that Sunday. I think it starts at 1. Um, and so you can go. You can get in, get involved in these panels, um, you know, and actually get involved and in get some interaction going on. And, and believe it or not, Matt uh, Leibowitz, who's actually on the line, he's actually uh, one of the um, moderators for one of those sessions. So, I mean, come check him out. And then the other thing we got going on is, just like we've done in many years past, um, we're also going to have the V Brown Bag Tech Talks going on. So those those will be going on throughout VM World. Um, those will be out in the community lounge, um, so you can go to the community lounge. They'll be kind of going on. There's there's actually a schedule up on professionalvmware.com, so you can go and look at that schedule. And you know, on the VM Underground uh, opening acts, there the schedule's up there too as to what panels are going on, who the panelists are, that type of thing. Um, as we as we move through this. Uh, through the session here, um, get involved in the conversation. Um, so you know you can hit any of these V Brown Bag hashtags. Uh, you know, in this case, at V Brown Bag, um, and then you can also ask questions on the V Brown Bag Twitter hashtag. So you know, go ahead and get involved, ask those questions, those type of things. Um, as you know, I mean, at this, or as most people know at this point, the VM, uh, the V Brown Bag, we're kind of global at this point. We've got sessions like all over the world and different, you know continents and things of that sort. So there's kind of our schedule. Um, so, you know, if you're listening to this and you're in a different country or a different area, you know, take a look at that and maybe get involved in the ones um, that are in your area. You know, it gives you a chance to kind of engage the community and learn new things. Um, and if not, I mean, all these are recorded, uh, you know, and you can definitely hop on and check them out. As I said, I'm John Harris and I'm your host tonight. Um, I'm at the VCAC guy and uh um, Brandon Wilmot is actually on. He's going to be co-hosting with me. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our presenters here. So I, I went ahead and handed it. Oh, yeah, you guys, absolutely. So actually, I handed oh, it over there to you. Yes, you guys have to engage. It would be very sad if you didn't. Um. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for having me. My name is Matt Leibowitz. You can see on the screen here, at Matt Leibowitz. Um, truly, truthfully, get to say, long-time listener, first-time caller. I'm thrilled to finally get a chance to present on the, uh, the B. Brown, Brown Bag. Uh, joining me is Joe Hogler, uh, who's with me as well. We're going to talk about virtualizing exchange tonight. So you know the hashtag on Twitter. Feel free to ask questions through there. Ask questions on the chat. We're, we're hoping to make this interactive. If you've got questions, feel free to just shout them out. So here's a high-level agenda of what we're going to cover. We're going to go through this. You know, you're going to see this slide again and again as we go through the deck. So why don't we just jump into kind of who we are. So um, my, like I said, my name is Matt Leibowitz. I lead the virtualization discipline for Americas within EMC Global Services. That's our professional services side. I'm a V expert, 2010 through 2014. Wrote the book, uh, Virtualizing Microsoft Business Critical Applications on VMware vSphere. Uh, and I am the official Paul Moritz stunt double. So anytime they need to send Paul into somewhere dangerous, they call on me and they tap me on the shoulder and say, you have to go and present in this, this really dangerous area. So uh, that's me. Joe, you want to give yourself a quick introduction? Yeah, and Matt, you must look pretty badass in that picture right there, I must say so. Um, so my name is Joe Hogler. I'm the practice group leader of the Infrastructure and Enterprise Systems Practice Group at Kraft Kennedy. Um, I'm basically responsible for all technologies, data center facing and backwards. Uh, Kraft Kennedy is a tech technology solutions provider, primarily for the legal community, but also some other professional services organizations as well. Uh, on Microsoft Certified Solutions Master Messaging, so primarily focused on the 2013 stack, um, one of about 22 people in the world that have that, um, and then a Microsoft Certified Master on Exchange Server 2010, that's a credential that I got in 2011, 
um, presented at numerous uh, technology conferences, Microsoft Tech at North America 2011, uh, Exchange Conference 2012, and, and various legal technology conferences and marketing events over the years and across the country. So I just want to say before we get started, despite, despite the fact that Joe is probably one of the few people in the entire world that has three different Microsoft Certified Master Certifications, he really only tweets about once a year. So maybe if we can get everyone on this call to follow him, we'll encourage him to share a little bit more. Yeah, so with I that said, Joe. All cool. right, Joe, it's all you. Take it from here. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about. Um, it's pretty simple, right? Um, bonus points to anyone that can identify something other than the Rubik's Cube on this slide. So feel free to, to tweet that if you want. So really when you're sizing for a virtualized exchange deployment, you really want to size for physical and then choose to virtualize. And that'll be a theme that you kind of see throughout this, this presentation that we give is, is you're really using physical guidelines but then gaining benefits of virtualizing exchange. Uh, and they're not the traditional benefits that you might associate with virtualizing another application. So again, you're sizing for a physical deployment, all those same rules apply, and then you're choosing to deploy it in a virtual platform. Um, one thing to note, as you may have seen, uh, those of you familiar with Exchange, CPU and RAM requirements have significantly increased in Exchange 2013. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, so the kind of the moral of that story is virtualization still does provide benefits, and we're going to talk about all of those, but you do need to understand the cost benefit, and we'll talk about that as well and what we mean by that. Um, first and foremost, you need to ensure you have an accurate user message profile before you go through sizing. User message profile is really the single most important piece of information that someone can obtain and must obtain when they're sizing an exchange environment. Um, this value, it's the number of messages sent received per user per day on average. You can gather this through scripts that Microsoft provides or through third-party solutions that you might have. But the important thing to note is that pretty much everything related to exchange sizing is ultimately tied to this profile. Um, IOPS that are required on the storage, CPU, RAM, all of these are calculated based on this value. Um, it really is the load of a user. So as you can kind of tell, this is fairly important. You should not assume either value. You're either going to undersize or you're going to oversize. Clearly, the undersizing factor, obvious problems. You're going to have poor performance or likely poor performance for your end users. Um, the oversizing can also be a problem as well. Uh, clearly, there's a cost factor, so you're over-allocating resources to something that doesn't need it, so that's no one really wants to spend uh, waste money nowadays. The other piece is, obviously, if you over-allocate CPU, as for any virtualization uh, administrator will tell you, that can be really bad. Um, you could lead to ready time, which is very bad, especially for an application like Change, which is CPU hungry. Um, you really want to avoid it. You want to allocate the right amount of CPU that you need based on your design, and then go from there, and we'll talk about considerations of what you need to consider when you're uh, virtualizing CPU for Exchange. Jet stress is absolutely critical to validate the design. Uh, historically, prior to ESX 4.1, uh, jet stress was not supported to run in guest, although it was still encouraged to do so. Um, it's perfectly fine and strongly encouraged. If I could say required, I would. Um, it is required for any deployment that I go through. Um, jet stress is critical to validate your design. And we'll talk more about that. The key point when you're virtualizing Exchange, it's not server consolidation. So those types of benefits that you try and get through other workloads, you're not going to get those from Exchange. Um, as you'll see, some specific supportability guidelines that you're going to need to abide by, as well as performance guidelines, you're not going to get those same benefits. However, there are still very, very strong virtualization benefits when you choose to virtualize, specifically around availability and the flexibility of the solution. And just I'll add to that, Joe. That's probably true for almost any business critical app that we talk about, whether it's Exchange or SQL Server or Oracle. It's it's less about the server consolidation and it's more about the benefits you get from virtualizing. Right. There you go. So diving in a little bit further, um, you can do two to one one CPU over subscription and still be supported by Microsoft. It's not recommended. Um, as you can tell, Exchange, SQL, other similar applications that are very CPU hungry, it is very strongly recommended to do a one-to-one -one CPU mapping. So again, you're, you're not trying to go for the consolidation route, you're going for the other virtualization benefits. So try to keep to that one-to-one. -one. If you need to go to two-to-one, you're still supported, but you still should strive for that. Similar to that, if you have a heterogeneous host environment, so you have different processor architectures, you need to ensure that the slowest host that could possibly handle exchange workloads when you're talking about VMware HA filling you over or wherever you may choose or your administrators may choose to move those exchange workloads, you need to make sure that that slowest platform can handle the CPU requirements that you've calculated for exchange. Because if exchange somehow gets on that host, you want to make sure you have a positive user experience when you're on that host. Um, so keep that in mind when you're sizing. Um, unlike CPU where there's some oversubscription that's supported, memory overcommit 
completely unsupported, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, um, you should absolutely use reservations to guarantee static memory for Exchange. Uh, memory is a very, very important part of Exchange, specifically the database cache that's used, um, as well as some, some architecture changes in 2013 for search. Very, very, very important. Uh, when you virtualize, you have some choices for storage presentation. So you really have three core choices here. You've got VMDK stored in VMFS. You've got host-based RDM, so RDMs that you'll present to the VMware host and traditional in-guest presentation that you might associate with a physical deployment, which clearly you can still do in a virtualized deployment. Um, generally speaking, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but generally speaking, the simplest is usually the right way to go for this. And, and when Matt and I, we go back about 10 years um, when we present on this together and, and gone through customer deployments, um, the indicators with VMFS is generally the recommendation that we provide. If the other requirements that you have in your environment, typically around backups, um, if those support that solution. So if you're going to do, and Matt will talk about backups a little bit later, um, the MDK is simplest, uh, very efficient as you all know, that's usually the right way to go. Um, but if you're required to, host-based RDMs is usually the, the next best option. In guests, we try and avoid unless it's required for a specific reason, only because, you know, why would you want to manage that complexity, MPIO, et cetera, within the guest, um, leverage the benefits of the architecture that you're deploying so that you don't have to have those uh, VM administrators manage the storage. You can handle that all in the back end. But remember, as we'll reiterate down the road, um, block storage is required all the way down to the storage. Hey, Joe, before yeah, I you... I add one point. Again, I want to comment on everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Before you guys get too far along, I did have a question from Graham Mitchell. Um, you guys had mentioned some scripts a little bit previously, and he was wondering, can, th can those be run against historical data? Um, you know, like maybe say data for the last year, is it something that you need to kind of run now on live data type of thing? Does Exchange keep that data? Sure. So um, the, the primary script that typically we'd use, I mean, clearly if you're using third party, if you've got some sort of monitoring solution that's gathering data, you can go as far back as that solution will let you go. So that clearly can be a bit more flexible. Um, the solution that typically is mostly used for those of us that are primarily focused on Exchange, um, it's called messagestats.ts1, not to be confused with Dell Quest message stats. Um, you can Google for it, you'll find it was written by uh, a Microsoft uh, employee. But that script basically calls your message tracking logs. So for however long you're keeping your message tracking logs, um, that's how far back you can go. Um, the script takes a single parameter, it's the number of days you want to go back. Um, by default, those message tracking logs are kept for 30 days, but if you've changed that, then you know it'll be more or less. But that's what that's going to use. Um, it's recommended to get you know short durations of message stats combined with longer ones. You know, so a couple one-day runs, some seven-day runs. Make sure you don't run it during a, a corporate holiday or retreat so that you're getting accurate data. Because if you get skewed data, you're going to get skewed sizing results. Um, but you can use that to basically dump out a whole bunch of raw information. And using some Excel magic, you can get all of the information that you need, specifically the message profile, average message size, all that kind of fun stuff. Great. Thanks. Sure. I just want to add one point before I move on. I want to comment on all of Joe's slides to make sure I look smart, too. But you know, I, one of the things I have a lot of conversations about when I talk about virtualizing exchange is this notion up here of the can't go more than two to one oversubscription for exchange. So does that mean that I need to create these silos for Exchange where no other workloads will run? Or what, is, what happens when I've got a really powerful server that's got 10 cores, and I've got two CPUs, I've got 20 cores, and I don't need that many cores for Exchange? Am I, am I wasting my resources? The answer is you can use CPU reservations for Exchange to guarantee the one-to-one -one mapping of virtual CPU to physical CPU, and doing now will guarantee the performance that Exchange needs, you'll still be supported, and it will let you run other workloads on the host. So don't think that just because it says two to one, that means you can't have more than that on the server if they're not Exchange workloads. Exactly right. Totally for Exchange. Um, so in general, this is a, a 2013 comment. So CPU, RAM, and storage capacity have significantly increased over Exchange 2010. Um, these are primarily due to architecture changes. So those of you that follow Exchange know that We've kind of gone from the Exchange 2007, 2010, multiple server role models, so five server roles, um, back very similar to the old 2003 monolithic model. Um, there was a question that we saw um, prior to the session about multi-role versus um, separate role, so we'll kind of tackle that at the end. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit more time talking about kind of why they made that architecture change and kind of went back to, or seemingly went back to what 2003 was. Um, but because of those architecture changes, clearly you're doing a lot more in code. So it, needs more CPU, needs more RAM. 
Um, search indexing moves from a, a different search index technology to search foundations, where it was the fast acquisition that Microsoft made. Um, that uh, search indexing technology, very robust, very beefy, requires more storage capacity for the index, requires CPU, requires RAM. So all of these things are combining together um, to significantly increase what you would need uh, to support that. So CPU requirements, again, all of this depends on your unique circumstances and, and what you're seeing. But CPU requirements generally for a like 2010 environment converted to 2013 uh, design, usually around 2 to 3x uh, CPU requirements is what we've seen for most of our customers. Um, RAM requirements is pretty much guaranteed to be 4x, but again, it depends on what you size for before uh, and if you're oversizing or undersizing. Uh, storage capacity requirements, you're generally going to see increased by 20%. That's per your, uh, purely because of the Search Foundation's indexing technology. Um, however, it's not all bad news. You do get storage performance requirement decreased 30 to 50%. Uh, that's a result of a, a number of architecture changes, most notably um, the store worker processes and moving the information store to manage C Sharp. Uh, a lot of these things made a lot of benefits for storage. And if you've followed Exchange over the time, you've seen how many uh, iterations of Exchange have improved storage performance requirements. It's almost a non-issue at this point. It shouldn't be considered a non-issue, but um, in almost all circumstances that, that I've done a design and a deployment, um, the capacity that I've needed, the spindles that I've needed for capacity have given me the performance that I've needed for Exchange, which is where you want to be. And it's very, very different than where we were in Exchange 2003. So when we go through Exchange sizing, um, you know, again, regardless of virtual or physical, these are the things you want to be concerned about or at least be thinking about. So the first thing is understand your design requirements, understand what you need for high availability and site resiliency. Um, where can this data be? How much redundancy do you need? And, and some of this might flow into some of the VMware or, or Hyper-V features that you can see, and, and we'll talk more about those a little bit later, and where you can kind of get one or the other or best of both worlds, and we'll kind of talk about that. Um, also want to know where your data can be, and sometimes and oftentimes it's not a question for IT. Are you subject to you know data privacy laws and things like that? So these are things that you want to make sure you understand what can you do, and then take the technology and sit that on top of the requirements that you have. Um, when you finally make those decisions, you know where you need it and, and what you need. Um, you start with the mailbox role. Everything flows from that because that is kind of the beefy thing behind the scenes in 2013. So again, you need that user message profile, as we mentioned, very, very important. Um, the average message size is important as well for things like storage capacity. Um, so once you get that data, you determine how much capacity you need. So typically, you're going to take your current consumption, you're going to add some growth, you're going to add some overhead, um, things along those lines, and you get to a new number. You do want to verify once you get that capacity number and how much storage, and again, there's a variety of storage architectures that you can choose. Once you understand how much storage you need, determine how many IOPS you're going to get from that storage, and determine if that matches the user load that you're going to get, which, again, flows from the user message profile. If it lines up and you get the IOPS that you need, great, you can move on. If you don't, then you start need to think about what you're doing with the storage and if you need to make some changes for that. Um, you do want to verify that your background database maintenance uh, if your storage is going to meet those requirements based on the database count. So background database maintenance is sequential passes over the database used to facilitate online maintenance. This was very, very aggressive in Exchange 2010. It was advertised about five to seven megabytes per second, and in 2013 it became less aggressive. It's now one megabyte per second, but it's per database copy. So however many database copies you're sitting on that storage, that's how many sequential threads you're going to need that's how much sequential throughput your storage is going to need to be able to handle. So make sure you keep that in mind, especially as you scale your database counts up for whatever reason, um, you need to keep that in mind. So once you figure out your storage, you then determine your mega cycles and CPU count. Again, all these flow from your user message profile. You determine your, me uh, your memory requirements. Those flow from the user profile. Um, you size your client access role client access server role based on the mailbox server role. So the, the random CPU that you're sizing for mailbox, that's going to flow into your client access role. Use the role requirements calculator and verify uh, manually if necessary. I will talk about that more in a second. But once you get all these and you get everything in place, you're going to run jet stress. You should run jet stress, and you'll validate that all the performance that you want to get from the solution, you actually do get from the solution after you've deployed it. So role requirements calculator, just use it. Um, it makes your life a lot easier. There's a lot of, I wouldn't call it magic, but a lot of great math that goes behind the scenes in the calculator. Um, you do need to know how to fill it out, though. So if you put in bad information or you make incorrect choices with the various parameters, you're going to get bad data on the other end. So you do need to make sure that you're understanding what you're changing, what the impact of the various settings that you are changing will have on the design that you'll get on the back end. Um, but 
once you do use it and if you use it correctly, you'll get the correct sizing that you will need um, for this and you'll make sure that you get what you need. Um, be sure that you understand the spec value for your host and the CPUs that you assign to the guest. So when you, when you do this, there's a baseline process architecture that Microsoft uses. It is different between Exchange 2010 and 2013, so you cannot use the 2010 calculator for a 2013 deployment. Use the 2013 calculator. But if there's a baseline number, you need to figure out what your host processor architecture is going to be, and you can use the, uh, the processor query tool to do that. Basically, you pop in your model, you find out what the spec and rating is for your model. That's going to be for all of the cores on that host. So you need to be um, make sure you understand that when you put in that mega cycles value into the calculator, you're putting it in for all the cores on that host. If you're going to assign less than all of the cores for the host to exchange, which is highly likely, um, you need to make sure that you prorate that uh, per core second value and whatever you're going to assign for vCPUs, if you're going to give it 10 vCPUs, for example, um, only put in the second value for 10 vCPUs worth of load um, versus the whole host. And that will give you the ability to understand truly what is the CPU utilization that you're going to have um, versus what you should expect. Um, the, obviously, the bad thing that you might do with this, if you put in the whole host value, you'll say, hey, great, I've got 12% CPU utilization for my design. This is perfect. Um, but if you only actually give Exchange much less than what the full host has, clearly your CPU utilization is going to go much higher. And if it goes beyond the 80% threshold that you want, then you're going to start to see bad things to happen. So make sure you understand what you're putting into it. Um, also, do include the hypervisor overhead. It is helpful. Um, but also understand that more significant overhead is going to be involved for things like mobile devices, the more mobile devices as you have, the more processor skew you're going to need. So make sure you do understand multiplication factors and what your workloads are going to be for that solution. Hey there, Joe. Hey Joe what's a good you know, hypervisor overhead use? I know, I know Microsoft has their recommendation and VMware has theirs, so do you kind of meet them in the middle? Um, typically, I mean, if you're using the exchange calculator, I usually keep it up to default, which is 10%. Um, I know VMware usually says 5%. Um, you know, my impression is usually give it a little bit more. Um, it's not going to harm you unless you're kind of on that edge of uh, maybe a processor architecture, things along those lines. Um, but the 10% number is the one that Microsoft wants you to use. Hey there, Joe. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions hey, here. Question? Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of questions around the sizing. And it sounds to me like, and, and get me if I'm wrong, but on a lot of the sizing, it's going to be a depends thing, and it's going to be using this calculator to create those, right, and to determine the sizing as you're deploying that environment, right? Um, I mean, I'm getting questions yeah, like, it, it, yeah, I mean, if there's some sample questions, we can certainly try and field those. But again, I mean, I hate to give you the consultant's answer, but it, it does depend. You know, and again, that's kind of why I, I tried to give you guys the, the lay down of kind of how you want to approach the design, because it truly is, every, every environment might be different, because there might be different business requirements that flow into that design. So that's kind of why where you, you want to start there to understand what you can do. And then once you understand what you can do, then you figure out how you should do that to get the performance that you need. Gotcha. I mean, some of the questions I'm saying, you know, requirements for CAS NLB servers, you know, do they need to be three and four times, uh, three times a CPU, four times a memory? My guess is that probably depends on the environment, right, and the workload and how many users you oh, have and things of that sort. Yeah, so that, so that comment that I made about three, you know, two to three times the CPU and, and four times the RAM, that's basically saying, you know, take a 2010 deployment that you've That's designed what I for, thought. you know, <laughs> yep. yeah, a thousand, a thousand users and just take that design and convert it to 2013. Change absolutely nothing, keep the same message profiles, keep the same user account, um, just basically convert that to 2013. And that's typically what you're going to see. Because if you think about it, the mailbox role in 2013 is now client access, hub, mailbox, and UM from 2010, all in the same box. So that server is going to be very beefy. Um, additionally, there's been some changes to how Exchange allocates database cache, which actually does quadruple the amount of RAM that you need, um, because it's basically giving you all that overhead on top of the database cache. Um, it's basically when information store starts in 2013, it takes a 25% chunk of system RAM instead of almost all of system RAM, um, because it keeps the other portions of RAM available for client access components, for search components, etc. Um, so because Exchange is taking less system RAM than it used to for database cache, you need to increase um, the RAM that you would allocate to Exchange to achieve the desired amount uh, of database cache that you would need. So that by itself, you're clearly going to quadruple it unless you were clearly undersized or oversized in your previous design. Great. And then there was just one other one. Sounds like this individual, uh, Grant Mitchell, he's just trying to 
confirm this. I mean, as you're as you're building out those, uh, you know, the back end databases. I mean, would you do like a small uh, number of large databases, or would you scale those out a lot of smaller ones? Um, yeah. So so I can answer that pretty quick. So really, what we want to do for that is my recommendation, uh, and this is what I do for for my customer deployments. So the, the maximum recommended database size by Microsoft is two terabytes. Um, so you do want to keep that in mind as you're sizing for this. In my opinion, the fewer larger databases makes the most sense for a variety of reasons. It's less complex to manage. Um, it's a bit more efficient on the back end for what, you know, how you're managing the storage. It's less background database uh, maintenance threads, which is less important in 2013, but you still need to think about it. Um, and it's just a generally easier to manage in general. Um, the thing you need to be careful with, though, that is your backup solution. So if your backup solution, if you're choosing to do backups and you're not going to go with native protection, which is beyond the scope of this conversation, but if you're going to do a backup solution, you need to make sure that you can backup and restore whatever size database that you've designed for within the SLA that you've defined for the business. So if the maximum size database that you can have and still meet those requirements is 750 gig, then 750 gig is the size that you should go, and then you're going to need to scale out because you have a business requirement that's requiring you to do that. If you don't have any of those requirements and the sky's the limit because you're using, you know, another solution, which again we'll talk about some of the options for that. Um, you know, I typically see my clients start at 750 gig or one terabyte if it's a, a larger deployment, and just kind of scale up from there. Um, I've definitely seen cases where we start at two terabytes, and, and usually it's for large amounts of, of old archive data that's just just so much. And to do anything less than two terabyte databases, we have massive amounts of databases, so we we'll typically kind of go from there. Okay, gotcha. I mean, so it's the typical answer. It depends. It's the design answer. Take it your depends. requirements and apply them. Design is half art and half science, right? There you go. All right. Thank you, Joe. Okay. okay Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Yeah, we hear you. Audio drop. So um, after you come up with your design, it's very, very important if you're going to virtualize what's supported and what's unsupported. So quickly, and we'll talk more about these a little bit later, but supported, all server roles. Um, granted, there's only three server roles in 2013, Edge, Client Access, and Mailbox, but all of them are supported to be virtualized. Um, all SVVP hypervisors, which, which Matt will spend a little bit more time talking about shortly, all of those are supported. Um, all the hypervisors are HA and clustering features. Those are supported. Um, vMotion, DRS, Live Migration, all those features are supported. Um, jet stress in guest as of ESX 4.1 and later, supported. Um, block level storage and SMB 3.0 for fixed VHDs only are supported. Um, there is no support for direct access to SMB shares, so directly storing Exchange database files on an SMB 3.0 share, that's not supported. But if you're doing a VHD file and storing that VHD file in a fixed form in an SMB 3.0 share, that is supported. But aside from that specific scenario, it's block level storage, and not just that, block level storage all the way down to the storage. It's not supported to have VMDKs um, sitting directly on an NFS share. It's, this includes the binaries volume for Exchange, so really anything that's exchanged by itself um, is not supported to be on NFS-based storage. This is a very common ask that I see in a lot of our clients. Um, technically, the OS volume is fine. If there's no Exchange components on it, you've deployed Exchange to not the OS partition. You put it somewhere else. Um, your Exchange databases and logs are somewhere else. Technically, you can put the Windows OS uh, on NFS storage, but you know my opinion is why have the added complexity if you're just going to drop that on NFS and everything else is not going to be there. The OS volume is not super, super large. Um, so my opinion is just keep it simple, keep it all in the same type of storage, and, and use your NFS for other workloads where it is supported. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. And Joe, the last point, that really only applies to Hyper-V, correct? Correct. But it is a change that was announced relatively recently, so we'd like to call attention to that. Uh, unsupported, and I'll, I'll credit Jeff Mueller uh, from Microsoft for the, the humor on the first slide, but unsupported, memory overcommit, memory reclamation, dynamic memory, mega memory, voodoo memory, anything relative to memory exchanges it wants its memory, get your hands off Exchange's memory. Um, static memory is required for all Exchange workloads. Um, one of the biggest problems with Exchange historically was lack of RAM, and, and this was a conscious effort that the product group made to re-architect the product from 2003 to 2007 to 2010 and beyond to better take advantage of more memory. Um, as you can probably tell, 
keeping things in memory much better for exchange to process. So you want to make sure that you're keeping it from going to disk. So the last thing you want is to have the rug ripped out from underneath Exchange uh, if you're doing anything relative to, to memory magic. Um, greater than 2 to 1 CPU over subscription. We talked about that previously. So greater than that is unsupported technically. Um, any sort of fancy things with uh, differencing or delta disks, that's not supported. Fixed disks. Um, thin provisioning is not recommended. It's not supported for the OS volume. It's strongly discouraged for Exchange database volumes. Um, Primarily because it, it does require a high degree of operational maturity to manage and resolve low disk space conditions, and there's clear risks of not resolving those low disk space conditions. Um, this can bite you really fast and really bad. So the thought here is don't thin provision. Um, there's also some questions about, well, if you thin provision your storage and you run JetStress like you should, um, you're going to blow out that storage to 80% of the volume size anyway. So if you do that, you've basically not thin provisioned at that point unless you're going to drop and reprovision the storage, in which case you've just invalidated the jet stress testing that you've done um, by changing the storage configuration. So it really is not recommended. Um, you do also ideally want to avoid other storage. I'll call it magic, so things like tiering, deduplication, compression, et cetera. Generally speaking, it's not worth it. Um, none of these technologies are supported by Microsoft, and, and really, what are they gaining you? So for deduping compression, if it's touching anything other than blank pages and white space, they're touching the insides of the database that have been highly tuned and changed with the architecture over time. So to make changes to that in a third party is, is makes me nervous and you might be breaking some of the performance improvements that the product group has made. And clearly if it's just touching white space and blank pages, then you're really not getting a lot of benefit by deduping or compressing those. Um, hearing, the general guidance that I provide on that is if you don't have enough IOPS in the slow storage to handle the full load, you're at risk for performance issues when exchange is on that slow storage. And if you do have enough IOPS for that slow storage to handle Exchange, just leave Exchange on it because use the faster disk and flash for other applications that actually do need um, that fast storage because Exchange is less IO intensive, IO hungry as it was in the past. Um, hypervisor snapshots, we'll talk more about that later, that later are unsupported. And this is more for Hyper-V, um, applications installed on the root. Anything other than the OS, antivirus, management monitoring software um, is not supported to run on the root volume. Okay. I'll admit this might be opening up a can of worms, but there's a couple of questions here. One of them is, what is the difference between okay. storing a VHD on SMB3 and a VMDK and NFS? Why is one supported and the other not? I mean, I know that so, that's just... So VMD, go ahead. So VMDK, a VMDK in v, you said VMFS or NFS? NFS. We'll talk more about NFS shortly. Okay. And another question that got asked is active active mirroring and storage supported. Not sure exactly what the question is asking for that. Okay. I can probably try to follow up on that. And I think the other one Are you referring to a are you referring to a storage platform that's automatically mirroring all the storage rights to another array? I assume that's that what the that question means? was directed at, yes. Alright. So so that's the question. I mean I you could do that. I mean, clearly, anything, any replication that's happening that's not, you know, native replication is not going to be supported by Microsoft. There's one exception if you use um, the DAG with a third-party replication API, and I believe EMC Recover Point is still the only solution that's supported within that paradigm, um, which does require synchronous rights. Anything other than that, it's not going to be supported by Microsoft. So then, the other end of that replication is potentially suspect. Nothing it is, but could be. Um, my recommendation would be just use the DAG. And if you're going to have two storage platforms, just sit DAG nodes pointing to one on either storage platform and let the native replication handle it for you. And now you're in a fully supported configuration. You've got two completely independent copies of the storage. Makes good sense. And another one came up here, and I think I already know the answer to this, but we'll go ahead and throw it out there. Um, so if you have an array that you know already does its automatic tiering in the background, should I, you know, such as a compellent or whatever it might be, maybe it's an EMC array, um, should they be pinning exchange to those specific ones, or go ahead and let the array do what it's going to do in the background? Personally, I would, um, and, and pin it to the slower storage as long as you've got the IOPS in the slower storage. Again, the comment that I made on, you know, you need to make sure you've got the IOPS there, because if you can't get exchange onto the faster disk, then what's the end result? Um, and then if you can get the IOPS, then, then why let it touch that fast disk? It doesn't, Exchange doesn't need flash or SSD or, um, or even really, really fast uh, rotational spindles anymore size it correctly, you design it correctly, you don't need it. Um, let it, the storage platform do its thing for other workloads that needs it. Because as you move things back and forth, you're, you're kind of in that, well, I don't have that 
blanket of Jets Rest to fall back on. I, I don't know what my storage configuration is providing me at this point. You hope it's faster if you're moving to the faster disk, but again, it's kind of, I'll call it magic under the hood for the storage, and if you can't see it and touch it and you can't validate it and confirm it, then you can't rely on it really for that. So that's kind of the guidance why you want to stay away from those things. Use it for the things, again, that really do need that really fast storage. Exchange is not that application anymore. Absolutely. So, I mean, it basically boils down to just because you can doesn't mean you should um, kind exactly. of scenario. Exactly. Um, and they're just flowing in here. Um, you mentioned hypervisor snapshots are not supported. What about using yep. them for uh, backups such as Veeam? So we, we talk about that later in the, in the presentation. Yeah, I'll cover that one. That's one of my favorite topics. That's one of your favorite topics. Okay, that's good. One of, one of my favorites. Okay, great. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you continue. Sorry about all the questions, all right. uh, bombardment. Yeah, no, no worries. Just want to make sure we, we get through so, so Matt can actually get a word in wise here. Yeah, I don't want you guys just to think Joe's the only smart person on the phone, even though it's true. But yeah, keep the questions coming, Twitter or through here. I'm, I'm watching Twitter. We have two screens here, so yeah. keep them coming. A good, a good question, guys. Thank you. Um, so hyper-threading, three cores, right? No. Um, they don't make cores appear out of thin air. Um, they are definitely not supported for physical deployments. You'll see that guidance on TechNet. The guidance for virtual deployments is a bit nebulous. It's, it's not entirely specific uh, on TechNet what you should do for virtual deployments. Um, it is supported. So the issue with why hyperthreading is not supported for physical deployments is because .NET garbage collection, which Exchange runs on .NET, um, there's an issue with garbage collection where memory is allocated based on the amount of cores that Windows sees. And if Windows sees an artificially inflated number of cores because hyperthreading is turned on and you're running Windows on bare metal, then you're going to over-allocate resources for .NET garbage collection, and that obviously is not good. Um, for virtual deployment, Windows just sees whatever you allocate to it from a host perspective. So as long as you're allocating the right amount of CPUs that you need, then you're going to allocate the right amount of threads for .NET garbage collection because that's how everything works out. Um, so for virtual deployments, leave it on at the host layer. Um, and obviously Windows will gain the benefit of, of whatever you assign to it. Um, the nice thing about that is you let the hypervisor use those um, lot extra logical cores for non-system processes, things like that. Um, whatever it wants to do with it, great. But make sure, again, that you're sizing for physical, excuse me, physical, physical cores um, when you go through your exchange CPU allocation. So NFS. Um, there will probably be a fair amount of questions on this, so I don't know if we may want to hold some of those until the end just to get through some of the other contexts. I know there's a lot of other good stuff we want to talk about, but um, it is not supported for physical or virtual deployments, and this does include VMDKs stored on NFS shares. Um, historically, there's been a lot of talk about this within various communities. There's a lot of contention with this. Um, the history primarily was around performance and reliability. Performance is very likely not an issue at this point. That's been pretty much resolved by modern implementations of NFS. Um, reliability is primarily the concern um, why Microsoft does not support it. And historically, it was around forced unit access or write through, um, write ordering, and torn I.O. protection. So very briefly, um, for FUA or write through, it's ensuring that all components in the solution honor a, a forced commit or a write to stable media intent. And so this includes all the way down to the storage stack, including caching components that might be between the application and the storage. Um, right ordering, so you need to make sure that the transactions are played into the storage in the order in which they were issued to make sure you don't have issues with things arriving out of order and then introducing call corruption at that point. Um, and finally, Torn IO protection, so, or yeah, Torn IO protection. So if you write it and you don't get success that it was written to the back end, then you get partial rights, and this can also deal with data corruption. So the hypervisor likely will handle um, all of these issues for you when you stick the hypervisor between the application and the storage. But at the end of the day, if the storage still is NFS under the hood, is the hypervisor going to fully enforce all of these all the way down through the storage stack? Um, that's primarily the risk why Microsoft doesn't support this. And to answer, I guess very quickly answer the question about SMB 3.0, um, you know, Microsoft, if you can see this was just Hyper-V deployments, so they have some confidence that based on how they've architected fixed VHDs and how they're interfacing with the SMB 3.0 shares on the Hyper, on, from Windows, uh, it's stored on Windows servers that are presenting those. So they understand the full aspect of that stack, and I'm certainly not a storage expert by any means, but I deal a lot with it with Exchange. 
um, they are confident that that will give them what they need. Part of this clearly is support risk. So, you know, again, if, if you go with NFS and you have a problem that is you know, really any problem in general with your database, first person you're call is Microsoft. It's the application owner, you want to get support. And if the issue is ultimately hardware related, it, it kind of stands them in a very sticky situation about how they handle that. Um, will it work? Probably. And you may have no issues if you do this for the lifespan of your deployment. Um, however, there's no plans to change the support stance and ultimately it is not supported. So, you know, if you're trying to mitigate risk and ensure complete supportability by the application vendor, so in this case Microsoft, you have to play by the rules and they don't support it. So if you uh, go along the lines with an unsupported solution, you may have unexpected results. And, and I, I will summarize that shortly. Sorry, somebody tweeted, Joe said it'll work. <laughs> um, so infrastructure as a service platforms, obviously very hot topic nowadays with public cloud and private cloud. Um, test and lab environments are really good use cases for this. Um, do all your testing, you know, do whatever you want with those, but it's not recommended for production use. Um, and this includes Microsoft's IAS platform, Azure, unsupported for product production use. Um, other IAS platforms are likely unsupported as well. You're not going to get an official support statement on this because it's, it's kind of in this vague, nebulous area. Um, and really the questions you have to ask are, is the hypervisor on the SVVP? Um, most cloud, or public cloud, I'll call it, um, IAS providers, they're using a customized version of some publicly available hypervisor, so Zen Server, Hyper-V, VMware, et cetera. Um, if you don't know what was customized, then you can't validate if they're within the parameters of the SVDP, and you're likely not going to get that answer from the provider because that's kind of their secret sauce a little bit um, of what they've customized and what they've done to be able to get the scale that they're providing. So that's one question. What is the storage architecture underneath? As we've talked about, storage is very important, and there's specific supportability guidelines around storage, um, NFS being one of them, obviously. So if you can't guarantee you're going to be within supportability boundaries for that, then you potentially will have a problem for that. Um, what's the disk performance for shared storage? Are they going to let you run JetStress in that public cloud provider? Those are the questions to ask. Uh, as well, consider the reputation of shared IP addresses for mail flow, controlling things like PTR records, SPF records, blacklisting and graylisting of public IPs. All of these things are a little bit out of your control when you're dealing with these platforms. So um, again, these are unsupported. Again, doesn't mean it won't work, but unsupported. And I just want to add one thing here quick, guys, that when we talk about infrastructure as a service platforms, what Joe is really referring to is the public cloud, Azure, AWS, VCHS. But, you know, the hybrid cloud is kind of the panacea where, where a lot of organizations are trying to get to. So what you see here doesn't mean you can't do this on your internal private cloud. Uh, you just can't put it in the public cloud. So you can manage exchange through your own, you know, internal private cloud and get all the benefits of a true cloud architecture. You just can't put the servers in the public cloud. Exactly. So to summarize for uh, supported and unsupported, so it's strongly recommended to stay within support or boundaries, because if you do, that's where Microsoft is testing the solution. Um, unsupported may mean it doesn't work, or it may just mean it wasn't tested, um, or may have been identified to have issues in some or all scenarios. So, you know, staying within supportability boundaries gives you the least risk. So you do want to make sure that you are working within that. Ultimately, unsupported equals risk. And again, don't cross the streams. I guess that's my cue to, to take over. So now you guys get to hear me talk for a little bit. So let's talk about virtualization support options. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that you know Microsoft, for all the, the flack that they get, they have really done a fantastic job of supporting their server and application platforms on virtual infrastructures, both theirs and their competitors. Uh, that's a whole other conversation when we talk about how they support their desktop operating system in a virtual infrastructure. But that's a story for another B Brown bag. So what Joe mentioned earlier, the SVDP, the Server Virtualization Validation Program, it's really a program that Microsoft came up with that lets them validate Microsoft applications and their operating systems across multiple hypervisors. So that's not only theirs, but vSphere and Zen and, and all the other ones. And essentially, it used to be there was this support policy wizard where you enter, what's my application, what's my operating system, what's my hypervisor, and it would spit out this mad support statement. They've really simplified it. Now there's just a really big list. As long as your application is on the list, and Exchange is obviously on the list, and the hypervisor supports the version of the operating system you're trying to run, 
you know, the not all versions of the vSphere support the latest version of Windows, for example, so you have to make sure those match. But as long as they do, Microsoft will support the environment. Uh, you can get to the SVBP by the link that's on here, um, or just Google SVBP. It's safe, that's the only thing you'll find. Uh, the other option is Microsoft support or Premier Support Agreement. So that is really a custom support agreement between the customer and Microsoft. So usually when you have this, you're a big organization, you've got this custom statement, Microsoft will usually agree to support you even in unsupported configs. So if you absolutely positively must run Exchange on NFS, right, get Microsoft to write you a custom Premier support agreement where they validate that, yes, they will support NFS. That doesn't mean you won't have problems from some un undocumented issue because they don't test on NFS, but they will support you. And then the, the last one is TSA Net. I'm not sure exactly how many people know about this, but this is kind of an organization that's a single entity that's designed to be the single focal point for contact when you're supporting multiple vendors. So if you've got, you know, just throwing out names here, if you've got Exchange Server running on vSphere on the back of a Cisco UCS Blade with EMC storage, you have a lot of vendors involved here, and then there's a problem you may not know who to go to. TSA Net can collaborate with VMware and Microsoft and others to get them all on the phone together and come up with a solution. So this is really good if you've got a complex multi-vendor environment and you need support uh, from one place. Go ahead. Someone trying to say something? Yeah, and, uh, yeah this is Joe. And just, just two quick comments. So one key point that, that Matt mentioned I wanted to reiterate for the Premier support case. Um, the key thing is, is tested. So they'll support you if you obviously pay them for the Premier support contract. Um, but if it's not tested, you still may run into outages. So you still may have a service availability issue even though you're hopefully going to get to a point where you can fix it. So if you really do want to mitigate risk, um, the, the real way is to stay within supportability guidelines because you know, future versions of the product, updates, you know, service packs, cumulative updates, et cetera, all of these are, are validated for supportability standards. So if you stay within those, you can be confident that you're in the best scenario. Um, we have a lot of clients in, in my space where they have a premier support contract and virtually all, if not all of them, still stay within the supportability guidelines for Microsoft even though they could technically go beyond it. Okay. So let's talk about uh, high availability and site resiliency. Uh, I'll start off by talking about when you want to protect Exchange, you want to provide high availability to Exchange, should you use vSphere HA, the built-in high availability feature of vSphere, or should you use Exchange database availability groups? And I don't know if we've introduced those properly or not, but essentially it's a native technology within Exchange that allows you to replicate your database across multiple Exchange mailbox servers so you have multiple copies of the database that can, you can fail over to should one of your servers fail. So it's built in native high availability, native replication. So you know, a common question comes up is, well, do I want that complexity? Because that requires some Microsoft clustering and some other stuff. Do I want that complexity or should I just leverage vSphere HA? Is that good enough for me? And there was a, part of the reason this came up is there was a time when Microsoft would not support vSphere HA. Those times are over, VM, Microsoft does support it, but the question still comes up. So when you're just using vSphere HA, you don't have any additional database copies, which reduces the total amount of storage you have to allocate to Exchange. You, you can have an environment where your business requirements call for two or three copies in one site and another copy in a, in a secondary site of your mailbox servers, of your mailbox databases. Now you heard Joe mention that sometimes you've got two terabyte mailbox databases. So, so when you've got lots of bad copies, that increases the storage footprint. You know, storage vendors like to hear that, but maybe not the best thing in the world. Uh, reduces the complexity of managing DAGs. You don't have to worry about replication, replication networks, Microsoft failover clustering, or anything like that. Just you, you put it on, and it's like any other VM. If the exchange goes or the ESX cycle fails, the VM starts over just like any other VM. So exchange VMs typically recover in three to four minutes. I'm going to show you kind of the anatomy of that in a second. The key thing to remember here is when you use vSphere HA, just like with anything else, this is really only protecting against hardware and operating system failures does not protect against anything at the application layer. And we'll talk about the differences in a second. So let's, let's go through the anatomy of a host failure. What happens when an ESXi host fails that's running an Exchange Mailbox server? So we've got our ESXi host failure. So what's going to happen, for those that are familiar with HA, you probably know, within 30 to 60 seconds, give or take, depends on how many VMs are on there and a couple other things, ESXi is going to declare the failure. It's going to be recognized, and the Exchange VMs will start on other servers. So that's usually in 30 to 60 seconds, the, VM, the failure is detected, and the VM is restarted on another server. 
it can take two to three minutes for that Exchange VM to move and then to bring all the Exchange services online and mount all the Exchange databases. So it could be up to four minutes before the full protection of Exchange is restored, meaning you've got Exchange back up and running, all your mailboxes are up, and it's on a host where if it fails again, it's going to fail, the, the mailboxes will fail over with, uh, with HA. So that's what just the vSphere, HA, and an ESXi host failure, that's what it looks like. So four minutes, up to four minutes, could be less, could be more, depends on how many databases we're dealing with and, and how much storage. But that's, that's four minutes during which your mailboxes are offline. So now when we, we talk about combining HA with the database availability group, now we're protecting against hardware, operating system, and application level failures as well. So now we're combining those features together. This solution, although it leverages Microsoft clustering, it does not require shared disks. So it's compatible with DRS, with vMotion, with HA, even storage vMotion. You can move your mail, mailbox VMDKs around if you need to. The thing I always like to say is that when you combine these two features together, you really get better protection than it would be really easily possible with just physical servers or vSphere HA alone. So when you combine these two, it's kind of the better together story. Uh, you get exchange restored to its fully protective state even when a hardware failure occurs. So and this is really the scenario. HA, and this is really the scenario that, that we see a lot of our clients. I mean, this, this is why they virtualize exchanges, because they get this added benefit by combining the native features of exchange with the native features of their hypervisor. Yep. Okay. So let's look at the anatomy now of an ESXi host failure with uh, HA and DAG together. So again, we've got our skull and crossbones. Our ESXi host has failed. Now two things happen. The first is in that same 30 to 60 seconds, ESXi has declared the failure and restarted the Exchange VMs on another server. But in that same 30 to 60 seconds, Exchange has also declared or recognized the failure, and it's begun activating those database copies on another node in the DAG. So in another mi roughly a minute, you've got your Exchange mailbox databases back online and accessible. Right? So that's a key point. In one minute, even before the Exchange VM is completed booting, you've got our, you've got our, our mailboxes back online. In two to three minutes, Exchange VM has completed its boot, but it has to rejoin the DAG. And essentially what that means is it has been down for some period of time. It needs to talk to the other members of the DAG, figure out what logs it's missing to make sure it has all the data, and it can update it its, so it has the same copy of the database. So it has to initiate a replication. So in two to three minutes, give or take, your server becomes a member of the DAG and it's back online. So now in four minutes, it took only one minute to get your Exchange mailboxes back online, but now in four minutes, the full restoration is in place and the full high availability of Exchange is back in place, meaning all of your nodes in the DAG are back online, providing the application level protection, and then the, serve, the HA is still protecting with the operating system and hardware level. So hopefully this illustrates, uh, you really, if you're going to protect Exchange, this is really the best way to do it. Combine vSphere HA with DAG. It's really not a one or the other kind of thing. Okay, Exchange, I'll go a little quick because we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, Exchange DR, do I want to use a DAG or do I want to use SRM? With a, with a database availability group, it's pretty easy, especially in 2013, to be able to say, well, I want to have a couple copies in my main site, and then I can put another copy in a DR site. So why do I need SRM for that? Right? I use DAG to protect the local site, or, um, and, and I'll, I'll use DAG to protect the DR as well. Well, the typical, comp typical combination we actually see a lot is DAG to protect the local site and SRM to provide site resiliency. So there really is no right or wrong configuration. Joe stole my joke. It really, before, it really, it, it depends, right? Everybody loves that answer. It comes down to, like everything else, you know, what are your requirements? With SRM, the, the, really the key benefit there is there's a single interface to recover Exchange and all of your other applications. So I don't need to tap the Exchange admin on the shoulder, or wake that poor person up in the middle of the night and say, hey, we have had a failure. I'm going to, fail, I'm going to bring everything else online, but you bring Exchange online. Right? There's no reason to, to wake up your Exchange admins and, and get them involved. The other thing is it offers the ability to test the failover without interrupting services. That's kind of native SRM functionality. When it comes to SRM, and Joe can talk about this a little bit, that's really the fully supported and recommended configuration. You know, it, it, it goes a little bit back and forth, I think, on whether Microsoft truly supports SRM. I think the answer is technically no. I'll let Joe talk about that in a second. But, you know, that's, this is the flip side. Now the Exchange admins can handle DR. 
So now if I just need to fail exchange over to another site for some reason, the exchange admin can do that. They don't have to involve a storage admin, a virtualization admin, and anybody else. And again, this is native functionality in exchange. There's no SAN replication software required. Yeah, so Joe, just a quick comment on SRM supportability. Yeah, I mean, basically, because of what it's doing to that Exchange VM, I mean, it, if a problem happens during that process, then, you know, you're not calling Microsoft for that. Um, and clearly, any of the replication at the storage layer, database copy replication, if you're just moving that data from point A to point B and failing over that VM, um, you know, it, it's kind of in that gray area. I, I don't believe it's supported at all. Um, what I typically see my clients do is, you know, they use native because, you know, it's it works great across site boundaries. Um, you know, why go with a third party solution when that's not supported by the application vendor when the native solution does work well? Um, and for the added flexibility of being able to do an exchange failover independent of a rest of site failover, because there could be certain failure scenarios that you may want to do that. Um, typically what I see a lot of my clients do, they use SRM for systems that don't have robust or really any native high availability or, or sorry, site resiliency features, they'll use it for that because it's it's great for those workloads that fails those things over when there is no alternative for it. Um, but they'll use, you know, exchange DAG um, for site resilient failover exchange. They'll use SQL AAGs for SQL failover across sites. They'll generally use kind of the, the, the native right size version for the application workload that they're doing. But clearly the sacrifice for that is um, simplicity. Okay, we're getting close to the top. I'm going to go quick here. Backup options, we, we talked about this a little bit. You really have three options when you're protecting exchange or backing up exchange. The first is the traditional backup agent that we're all familiar with. It's the same in physical and virtual. It's all a piece of software inside the guest, and it, and it backs up that way. The other is the SAN-based method, where you're essentially using RDMs to present the raw storage to exchange virtual machine, and then you're using some sort of SAN software to do that, that backup. The other one that's really popular is VM or image level backup. So that's something that takes a backup of the entire virtual machine. Um, and it then allows you to either restore the entire virtual machine or some of the vendors even you know, support the recoverability of individual items, a mailbox, a user in Active Directory, even down to an individual email. So you get a lot of options there. All of the, most of those backup products, I will say, rely on uh, virtual machine snapshots, right? They need to make sure that the, the copy is consistent before they take the backup, otherwise the restore might not work. Microsoft explicitly does not support the use of Exchange with virtual machine snapshots. So I know that a lot of vendors use virtual machine snapshots, and I have probably angered a few of them when I, when I talk to customers and I talk about this, but the fact is it's really not supported. Um, generally speaking, it's not supported because they don't want you to revert, right? You take a snapshot, wait an hour, two hours, a week, 10 weeks, a year, whatever it is, and then try to revert back. That is obviously not going to work. That's not supported. Is the use of a, a virtual machine snapshot for backup, is that really not supported? You know, I would say speak to your vendor, speak to the backup vendor, speak to Microsoft to get a true statement on that. But, uh, you know, Joe and I have escalated this up a number of times, and generally speaking, the answer is no, it's not supported, and you'll have to go back to your storage vendor or your backup vendor for the initial support. So just kind of general guidance when you're backing up your virtual machines for Exchange virtual machines. You know, whatever backup software you're going to use, make sure that it leverages VFS so you get that application-consistent backup. So it's not just crash-consistent, it's actually application-consistent. Uh, use the backup that works best for your organization. If you try to use one product for Exchange and one product for SQL Server and some everything, something else for other, you know, software, it becomes difficult, right? And when there's an outage, you don't want to have to, again, find the right person that knows this backup product to restore it. And then, like I said before, if you're going to use an image-based backup, I, I think they're great. There's a lot of great vendors out there. Just make sure you get a clear support statement from them and Microsoft so you know what to do when there's a failure. Like you see in the picture here, you don't want finger pointing. But it changes down and you need to restore a database or restore a server or something. You don't want to have Microsoft say, we need to call vendor X. And vendor X say, it's fully supported. You should call Microsoft. That wastes precious time, and you don't want to extend your outage. OK, we're almost at the end here, guys. Best practices, DAGs and vMotion, right? DAGs rely on Microsoft Windows Failover Clustering, or MFCS, as it used to be called. So they're really intolerant to network hiccups, right? They've got a heartbeat that goes in between all the nodes that say, are you alive, are you live? And during a vMotion, that is a brief drop in network. And actually, this happens during snapshots, too. Um, 
the cluster could detect a failure and essentially start activating database copies on another server because it thinks your exchange DAG is down. So there's really two ways to get around this. The first is, uh, and this is not a, an exchange setting, this is a Windows setting. Windows has the ability to change the, uh, the delay, the heartbeat delay, I should say, between the nodes. So there's two settings. The first is a, a delay that says, um, in milliseconds, you know, what's the frequency of these heartbeats, right? So default is one millisecond. So every second there's a heartbeat going between each node. The threshold says, how many missed heartbeats will I tolerate before I declare a failure? So the default is five. So five heartbeats over five, over, you know, the default value of a thousand milliseconds, that means five seconds. After five seconds, it will declare a failure. Most people will say, well, that could be motion in five seconds. But the reality is Exchange has lots of memory, and you, you've seen many, many times that this actually causes Exchange failovers. So it's a pretty simple solution. You can increase these values to something like 10 seconds, either increase the default value of um, the delay or the amount of heartbeats that it will tolerate missing uh, to get around this problem. That's the typical solution we see. Microsoft, I mean, I should say VMware has done a number of tests on this as well, and they found, believe it or not, all they had to do was enable jumble frames on the vMotion network. Microsoft, uh, they, the DAG never fell over. So I know that, you know, <laughs> using jumble frames and is kind of a contentious topic amongst people, but that's another consideration as well. So I just wanted some quick tips for combining uh, vMotion and DRS. If you can, use both jumble frames and the increased cluster heartbeat, right? Why take the risk? of it going down when you're doing a vMotion operation, and you don't want to enable, um, you don't want to disable DRS for these workloads, because then you lose a lot of the benefits of virtualizing in the first place. Uh, use multi-NIC vMotion, I think that's VCR 5.1 and above. Uh, that's going to make your migration feel faster, even if you're migrating just one of these. Remember, one of these mailbox servers could have 64 or 128 gigs of RAM. The more NICs you have at it, the faster it's going to go. Uh, don't combine those vMotion interfaces with other VM kernel ports like storage or even the management network, there's really no reason to do that, especially because vMotion can saturate NICs. And then finally, you can increase that cluster heartbeat in Windows Server 2012 all the way up to 240 seconds, or four minutes. But should you really do that, right? Does it make sense to say, I'm going to delay exchange declaring a failure for four minutes? Obviously, you wouldn't want to do that. I think that's going to affect your SLA. It's going to affect how quickly you can recover from an outage. So generally speaking, um, you know, test this in a lab. Find what works for you. Don't just crank it up to the highest possible value. So thanks, everyone, for, for keeping with us. I haven't seen anyone drop yet, so that's awesome. Hopefully, uh, you're keeping interested. So a couple more things, and then we'll open up for some questions. So it kind of summarizes a lot of stuff we already talked about, but as well as introducing some, some new information as well. So overall best practices, don't oversubscribe CPU or memory. Clearly, we talked about the supportability guidance, memory, unsupported. Um, you do need to make sure you use static reservations for that. Um, CPU, obviously, we talked about the oversubscription. But that being said, don't disable the balloon driver. Um, ballooning is better than in-guest OS swapping because the in-guest OS, or sorry, from, from host swapping, because ballooning tells the in-guest OS to swap out the pages it doesn't need, which obviously it's more aware of what's going on with the application workload. If you can't balloon, then the VMware host manages the swapping, and that has virtually no visibility into the guest, and that could result in really, really bad performance. So again, do the static reservations, but if it needs to balloon for some reason, don't prevent it from doing that because you could make matters worse. Um, use eager zero thick for your exchange data, data volumes. Just max provision them. You're going to likely be doing that anyway when you do debt stress, so why not just eager zero thick them? Um, configure the maximum of four vSCSI controllers that you can provide for an exchange virtual machine, and then evenly distribute the storage across um, those vSCSI controllers. Uh, similarly, for those vSCSI controllers, use pvSCSI. Um, there was a question that we got before um, the session started, so um, that was submitted to us. So to answer the question, I, I think that answers the question here. So use all four, evenly distribute. Um, the general guidance is if you're going to co-locate databases and logs on the same VMDKs, and we won't go into that unless there's a question about it, but if you're going to choose to do that in Exchange 2010 or 2013, um, then just evenly distribute however many VMDKs you have across all four of these vSCSI controllers, make the most lanes for that highway to get the I.O. passed. Um, if you do need to segregate databases and logs onto their own VMDKs, typically this is a backup solution requirement. Um, if you need to do that, then you want to keep the like IOID patterns of the databases more sequential-ish as of 2010 and later. Um, keep database VMDKs across their own two vSCSI controllers and then put the logs on the other two vSCSI controllers, but again, evenly distribute. 
Um, there's no settings that you really have to change for this. So PBSCSI does have a larger QDEF than LSI controllers anyway, so you really shouldn't have to touch it. But again, remember that exchange is not as I.O. intensive as it was before. Um, and again, jet stress is very, very important to ensure that all of the storage pieces are in line all the way down from the application, all the way down the storage stack. Um, use hyper-threading hyper at the host level, as we talked about. Let the hypervisor use it for whatever it needs it. Um, the Windows guest only sees the vCPUs that you assign, so make sure you don't over-allocate those. Um, really, a, a key design point that you do want to make sure you're always aware of is align your application, virtual machine, your virtual host, your storage, and your networking failure domains. And we'll talk about that shortly of what that means. So failure domains are, are things that fail. Make sure that you understand if a what is in a failure domain and, and what is out. Making sure that if you have some component failure, um, make sure that other things that are reliant don't also fail as well. So a good example of this is if you run multiple exchange VMs, and specifically it's like rolled VMs, so if you put all your CAS for some reason on one virtual host and you put all your mailbox on another, I don't know why you do that, but if that's how it is, um, make sure that one component failure or however many component failures you're sizing for in your design, you know, double server, triple server, whatever it is, um, make sure that those component failures won't take down the entire solution. If you lose a host with all your CAS, you can't get to your mailbox servers. Um, database copies, make sure if you've got, you know, for example, a very common design that we see is two copies of your data in your primary site, one on your secondary and scaling up from there. So if you have your two copies in your primary site on the same VMFS volume, the same RAID group, the same SAN, there's obviously single points of failure involved in that. And if those single points of failure actually do fail, you could wind up losing both copies of your data in your primary site and then require you to fail over to your site resilient location, which may violate SLAs, may cause all sorts of problems. Network pathing, make sure you do have redundant paths for anything that's networked, especially if you're going to do iSCSI storage. Um, understanding, obviously, the NFS supportability guidance, you're typically going to see iSCSI or, or Fiber Channel as your storage presentation mechanism. If you're doing iSCSI, you really have to make sure that you're redundant on the pathing, because if you don't see your storage, you're not going to have a very good exchange environment. Um, surrounding systems as well, Active Directory, your domain controllers, making sure that what, what hosts are they on if they're virtualized and if you can't move them across or whatever you've done in your environment, making sure you have AD available because Exchange is completely dependent on Active Directory and DNS. Um, your file share witness, so if you have a database availability group architect where you've got an even number of nodes, um, you need a file share witness to break that top for quorum scenarios. Where's that file share witness? Uh, it could be on a client access server if you've broken out your roles, if you've done multi-role, it's going to be some other server in your environment, so understand where that is and make sure that if you need it for quorum, um, you can access it based on the failure that happened. Um, really, the, the important thing is that you're understanding what can happen and understand what catastrophes you are sizing for, whether it's an actual catastrophe or something like this. Okay, we're out, we're out of our uh, movie references here. Just really quickly, a shameless plug. It's not really shameless. I actually have a little bit of shame when I say this, but yeah. Uh, my, the book that I wrote last year with Alex Fontana, from Fontana excuse me, who was previously with VMware, uh, he was their exchange guy, uh, you know, covers Exchange, SQL Server, uh, Active Directory, SharePoint. Uh, Joe was actually one of the technical editors on it, so, you know, you can kind of get an idea of the quality of the, uh, the editing that we had there. And then it's not just technical, it covers, you know, things like building a business case and objection handling and things like that. So it, uh, a lot of effort went into it. Uh, if you're interested, definitely hop on Amazon and, and buy it. I think I get 32 cents every time someone buys it. So got to save for college for the kids. So that's it, guys. I realize we're over a little bit. Um, I want to open it up to QA both on Twitter and on, uh, on the chat. I see a couple that came in over Twitter that we can answer if there's nothing on the chat. So I can probably jump in. We had a couple questions coming in beforehand, so I can jump into those, I guess, while we're collating those. I think we've answered a lot of them already. Um, dedicated data stores for Exchange. Uh, we did have a question about that, of whether it's recommended to dedicate a, a data store for Exchange database and logs versus co-locate. Um, you know, one thing to consider is, you know, what your definition of data store is. Keep in mind NFS, and if you've got some stores that you're presenting that is NFS, then you got to understand the Exchange supportability on that. Um, however, if you're using VMFS, you know, vSphere 5.5 now supports 64 terabyte VMFS volumes and 62 terabyte VMDKs. You probably don't have to create dedicated VMFS volumes for Exchange anymore. Um, so kind of keep that in mind that you don't technically have to do it. Um, other questions, sizing volume, or sorry, uh, restores from things like Veeam and things like that. Uh, what's supported, what's recommended. So we do recommend if you're going to go with backups, uh, if you need to restore items uh, or mailboxes, 
most uh, modern backup solutions have some sort of granular restore technology where you can take items or mailboxes individually um, out of those backups and, and not have to restore a whole server to get what you need. So that generally is the preferred route. If you did have some sort of catastrophic failure where you lost an entire server, um, from an exchange perspective, it's typically way more efficient to just rebuild the server, especially if you're virtualizing. Deploy a fresh VM from your template, drop it, um, name it the same way, um, do all your patching, do all your testing, things like that. And then when you install Exchange, you can use a switch slash n recover server. What it does is actually pulls um, a lot of configuration for that server from Active Directory as it existed when it died, and will reinstall Exchange almost exactly how it existed um, on that server. And you just rejoin it to your DAG, you add your database copies, and you do all that stuff. That's usually better than trying to restore from a snapshot, which as we've talked about, it's not supported. Um, you'll have some issues, and, and there's other steps that you need to do with that. Obviously, when you're doing the recover server, you do need to reset the AD account. It's well documented on TechNet for how to do it. That's usually the best way to go, um, results in the cleanest restoration of service. And again, if you're using the DAG, you typically have other copies, so you're not down while you're doing this. You're just restoring uh, some level of resiliency. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's, uh, there's a one or two on the um, Twitter uh, John, anything on the chat that we want to get to? Our guys are actually, actually hanging out at Reels for a little longer. Actually, actually, yeah, I was just kind of waiting for you guys to finish up there. There is a couple. Um, and I assume on this one it's probably, you know, along the lines of actually applying some of those best practices around the DAG and vMotion. But it looks like we've got an individual out there that's asking, is there any way to stop both DAG servers from vMotioning at the same time? Um, apparently they've had some issues where, both of them be motioned at the same time. This caused, you know, interruptions, you know, you know, basically for them to kind of drop offline. Um, so they've actually had to go and pin one of those, you know, DAGs to a host. Um, and they were just kind of looking for some recommendations on, you know, what you would do there. So what I would do is that's an unfortunate scenario, and I have to wonder how common that is. I mean, unless you've got a really small environment where there's not a lot of VMs moving around. That, that's a that's unfortunate. But yeah, the only thing that I could say is pin it to a host, at least one of them, and prevent it from moving around. Use anti-affinity to make sure that it doesn't start on the same node or the, the VMs don't end up together at power on. Uh, but otherwise, that's really the only option that I can think of to do that. So, uh, you know, that's a tough one. I don't think I've ever heard of that happening before. Yeah, yeah I, that's I probably the, the thing to think about is. Look at look into what's causing that maybe because if there is some sort of constraint or, or some sort of issue that's going on maybe try and resolve the issue if it's recurring um, but obviously if it's not then then obviously what Matt mentioned absolutely um, another one that came through is um, you know you guys were talking about kind of messing around with the heartbeat um, configuration within the DAGs um, so can those same heartbeat configuration settings help with DAG events caused by hypervisor snapshot-based backup methods? <laughs> yes, they can. Actually, to be honest with you, that is the first time that I really saw the issue was a few years ago with Exchange 2010 and a popular backup product. Uh, that what was happening was the DAG was failing over overnight. And what was funny is the admins didn't even know what was happening. The only way they found out was with their, I think they had SCOM or something. It was alerting to them that the event log entry indicated that there was a failover. But actually, no one noticed that the database has failed over. So yes, what's happening is, uh, for those that don't know, when you take a snapshot, you know, ESXi needs to stun that BMDK for just a brief second to switch over to the redo log to start writing over there. During that stun, again, you lose that network connectivity because the whole thing freezes. And you have the same problem. It's just like a vMotion. So yes, you can use the same cluster heartbeat timeout settings to help with that as well. Great. Um, another one, yeah, I kind of let them queue up here. Um, what are you guys seeing customers do with 2003 CAS roles and DMZs? Are, are they keeping the CAS in the DMZ with tight ECLs or keeping the CAS on the local LAN, on the local WAN oh. with MBX role? Sure. So uh, to me, you mean 2013 because 2003 is not supported anymore. I'm sorry, I meant 2013. I just said that wrong. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so the client access role in 2013, it, it is, I, think it, I, w I wish they hadn't called it the client access role. There's reasons why, but it is very, very different than CAS in 2010 or 22 or 2007. Um, it, it is thin. It's stateless. It's a protocol proxy. It's very lightweight, but it's a domain joint server. 
has to be domain joined, not supported in the DMZ. So like in 2010 and in 2007, the only server role for Exchange that's supported in a, in a DMZ is the edge transport role. Well, there you go. That, that, that pretty much sums that one up pretty clearly. Um, how do various... <laughs> How do various Exchange server roles handle IP address changes in a DR scenario? The, the IP is, is fine. I mean, obviously, it depends on how you're doing it and the timing of how those things are happening. I mean, Exchange uses DNS. Um, so, you know, those are things to really just consider is as long as DNS updates and Exchange can find out where it needs to go, it, it's fine to change the IP address as long as that timing works out. You can't change the name. That's unsupported. You need to uninstall and reinstall Exchange to change the server name. So that, that keep that in mind. Um, things to think about, though, if you're if you're moving things around and changing IPs, clearly, you know, DNS is, is one big one. So make sure you're understanding your TTLs and you know what's going on with that. Um, the other things, if you're change, if you're using um, dedicated replication networks, which you may or may not want to do in 2013, if those IP addresses are going to change as well. Keep in mind your static routes that you set up to make sure that nodes can talk to each other across site boundaries, because um, clearly those won't, wouldn't work anymore after you change those. So you need to make sure you address those. Um, you know, again, this kind of goes to the complexity of kind of what happens when you're dealing with those types of failover scenarios versus if you've just deployed Exchange out there, the failover is very seamless. You're not doing any changes there. You're just basically activating database copies, um, potentially doing nothing more than activating database copies. It's only if you have a quorum issue where you no longer have quorum to maintain availability, that's when you need to do the actual exchange failover steps to do that. If you have quorum, which is a variety of ways to ensure you have that, um, that's going into design, so I don't want to spend too much time on that, but if you have quorum, it's just a database copy activation, which as Matt mentioned is seconds to failover. Gotcha. I assume you might have already covered this, but I'm going to throw it out there. Um, got a Got somebody out there that's in the middle of implementing a vplex metro configuration for a vblock. Client has asked if Exchange and SQL are supported, and they're kind of new to vplex. Do you know if it's supported? Are there any caveats uh, to being able uh, to have Exchange in that environment? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know specifically if there's anything that is says it is supported or not supported. Um, I do have clients that put their Exchange storage on vblock. Um, as part of, you know, there it's typically I had one client that had a VMAX and the VBox solution sitting on top of that and some blades. Um, that ultimately was supported. I mean, whether it is or is not, I mean, ultimately I would defer to the vendor and ensure that you get that supportability statement because you want to make sure you're covering all your bases. There's no reason why it shouldn't be if it's abiding by supportability guidelines, specifically things like block storage all the way down. Um, as long as it's meeting those requirements, there's no reason why it shouldn't. It's just another storage platform. But you know you do want to make sure you understand what you know, what makes this solution different than its competitors. Are they doing anything special? Um, you know, make sure you understand what those are, and, and you do get that support statement that says this is a fully supported solution. Yep, and that's kind of along the lines of what I was thinking there. Um, and I do believe that there was one other question that came up earlier, and I can't remember if we answered it. Let me find it here. Um, was this the one about the balloon driver? No, the balloon driver one, I believe we answered, did we not? Um, I yeah, that, got, that got answered on Twitter. Uh, give me a second here. I just got to find it. <laughs> I'm kind of trudging through what I have here. Um, well, while you're looking through that, I've got two go others, I think, that we before the session. So one was um, someone asked about front end and back end from 2003 to the server roles of 2007 and 2010, and then you know, obviously the, the new architecture of 2013. Um, unless people want to, I don't want to keep people later than they want to be. Um, I won't go into the details of, of why the product changed. There were some specific reasons why it's evolved over time uh, into this model and, and how we got to where we are in 2013. Um, the question that was really asked is, you know, do you separate out CAS from mailbox or, or do you combine them, which you can do either. They're both supported. Um, when you combine CAS and mailbox, it's generally called multi-role in 2013. Obviously, it's multiple roles. Um, in most cases, multi-role makes the most sense. Um, for physical deployment, there's, there's really not much need to break this out. CAS is just so lightweight and modern hardware is so powerful that it doesn't typically make sense to deploy CAS on its own hardware. Um, so we're talking about virtual. Um, it still usually makes more sense to, to do multi-role because if you're going to size for a mailbox, that's going to be the majority of your load anyway. Um, CAS is has resource requirements, but it generally can can use some of the resources of mailbox, um, bridges some of the gaps there, and then obviously has its requirements on top. Um, Typically, 
you're going to need more mailbox servers to handle your load um, than CAS because CAS is so lightweight. You get a lot of scale with those. Um, so you might need, you know, for example, four mailbox servers for your uh, for your load, for example. And if you only need two CAS uh, for that design, you'd actually get better resiliency for client access functionality, twice of what you would need if you just did multi-role and deployed four multi-role servers with increased requirements. Um, so that's generally the recommendation. It's, it's definitely Microsoft's recommendation. It's part of their preferred architecture that they announced earlier this year. Typically makes better use of the hardware. Fewer servers means easier management, easier patching. Um, to do it separate, there's no real strong recommendation from Microsoft for when to do this. Their strong recommendation is to do multi-role. Um, you know, if you're virtualizing, maybe it makes sense if you need to, you know, fit the exchange servers into an existing infrastructure, but, you know, then you should really be looking at, you know, are you trying to fit a square peg into a round hole or do you need to be thinking about things differently? Um, I'm sure there's use cases that people might come up with for this, but the general recommendation is to do multi-role. Um, but there is the flexibility if you have a specific reason why you want to do this and, and you believe it's the right way to go, totally supported, you can break out capital as for mailbox, deploy that that way, um, and that will certainly work for you. And I've had clients that have gone both ways on this. So there's a question that came in on Twitter. John, you want to ask that one? Oh, you mean the one that I just, okay, yeah. So then I'll throw it out there. Yes, that, that was the one that I was looking at. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so they, they were asking, what are your thoughts on host-based caching solutions specific uh, benefits, risks in an exchange implementation? What are you guys' thoughts on that? I'll take that one just quickly, Joe, and you can add your color if you want, but usually those solutions involve solid state, you know, flash memory to, to cache the reads and the writes to improve performance. And, you know, like Joe said earlier, you can do that, but Exchange doesn't need it. When you look at the I.O. profile of Exchange, the number of IOPS is really, really low. It's not like Exchange 2003 or earlier where it really can consume your entire, you know, SAN architecture can use it, but I would say there really is very little reason to do that. As long as you properly design Exchange to run on the spindles of the disk that you have, you shouldn't need those solutions. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's just added complexity, added cost, and, and again, it's for, excuse me, for what benefit. So, I mean, I, I typically say keep Exchange out of those, just, you know, give it what it wants, kind of keep it pretty static, um, and then leverage those technologies and those features for other workloads that can significantly benefit from it. You know, VDI obviously being a really good use case for that. Great, and I'll just throw this one out there. You guys may have already uh, answered it, but I'll throw it out there. Are CAS servers still recommended, or are real load balancers? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about probably NLB or, or load balancers. Yeah. So yeah, um, exactly. Despite having yeah, despite having a very very popular blog post on the internet about how to do NLB on 2010, which Matt's probably talking about right now, um, I certainly don't recommend it. Microsoft doesn't recommend it. Um, Usually the guidance that we provide is, you know, there's some definite scale and reliability issues with NLB. It, it does work, and, and I guess it's better than nothing. But um, the primary thing is it's free. But you can get a load balancer, a purpose-built load balancer, for so inexpensive. There's really one at every price point. You, you don't have to buy a super expensive tens of thousands of dollars load balancer. You know, you can get one for a thousand bucks, virtual platform as well. So, you know, our recommendation is typically you're going to spend more time and frustration and money managing an NLB-based load balancing platform than it would be to just buy an actual load balancer. Um, so that's that's always been our recommendation is buy one that meets your price point needs. Um, and if you can co-locate other workloads through it, other applications that could benefit load balancing, then you're getting better scale uh, across those load balancers. Um, but definitely get a load balancer. You've got a lot more flexibility. 2013 does change the load balancing game a bit. It's, it's much less dependent um, on the special features of load balancing, specifically layer or seven and session affinity, um, but you still need to do load balancing. And even if you're just doing basic load balancing, a real load balancer is much better than you know NLB. Awesome. And I believe at that oh, and somebody just threw out any good blogs on load balancers. Anybody got any thought on that? Questions just keep coming. Uh, blogs on load balancers. Um, I know that's kind of a bit off topic there. Yeah. I mean, I can. You know, I don't want to be vendor feud or anything. I mean, it, obviously, you know, Gardner Magic Quadrant's good to kind of get the lay of the land. You know, there's there's two clear leaders in the space. Um, they're a lot more expensive than some of the other ones. Um, there's lots of great load balancing players. Um, you know, I would pick one that works for you. The ones that I've I've personally seen most popular in my client deployments 
um, you know, F5, Citrix, um, Netscaler, and uh, Kemp Load Master, although I've seen lots and lots of other ones as well. Those are just the ones that I typically see more commonly. Okay, and this one came out to, um, I guess is, is you're probably is, you know, size it appropriately, but somebody did ask, um, as far as um, storage I.O. control, network I.O. control, you know, how does that play into an exchange architecture uh, where storage and bandwidth to the storage are under contention? What is your guidance in that scenario? What would you do with that? I, I would enable it. I don't know that it, I would, here's my, my thought on that. Exchange doesn't need it because it's not a high I.O. workload, but it can protect Exchange from the noisy neighbor that's on the same data store that's consuming too much I.O. for Exchange to meet its requirements. So Exchange doesn't need it to meet its performance because, it's, again, it's really I.O., not I.O. intensive, but I would enable it to make sure that something else is not consuming too much I.O. and hurting Exchange. Yeah, because the key point is, you know, you, you come up with some amount of capacity that you need, performance and actual capacity, and, you know, you're going to configure it, you're going to validate it with jet stress, and you're going to hopefully get you know, the nice result from JetStress that says not only have you passed, but you've also achieved your I.O. requirements based on your design. And if you get all that, but then you're operating maybe under a, an ideal scenario when there isn't any contention, then you get contention. If you were kind of right on the borderline of if your solution was meeting your requirements versus not, and then, you know, some other rogue workload comes in and starts stealing I.O., you know, yeah, Exchange doesn't need a lot of I.O., but it still needs some. And if you're going to take what precious little I.O. it does need away from it, then it's obviously not going to react very well for that. So you need to make sure you've got, you know, that level of operational uh, aspect to make sure that you can guarantee Exchange will at least have what it needs to operate and it won't go below that. So, yeah, so great. I mean, so, I mean, if you have the licensing and it's there, can't hurt, it's a great safety net type of scenario. Um, I think that sums up pretty well. Awesome. Um, so at this point, it looks like the questions have actually uh, started to taper off. So yet again, thank you guys for one more. If we have if we have two more, we have two more minutes. There's one more that I saw, I think I'd asked a couple of times, and that was, um, you know, change 2013 for a small business. Maybe there's just one host. I, I don't want to spend a time a ton of time on this because this could go in a number of different directions. But I'll just I'll I'll pose it to Joe. Where do you draw the line to say small customer, one host, Office 365, or in-house? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a tough question. I mean, I guess the first question we really always ask our clients about this is, you know, what are your business requirements? Kind of go back to the first question or the first bullet in my, you know, exchange sizing uh, session, which was really understand your requirements. And, you know, if you have specific business requirements that say your data cannot be hosted in a public cloud, um, obviously, Office 365 and other providers, but primarily focusing on the Microsoft platform here, it's gotten a lot better, has gotten a lot of uh, great certifications, great press around security. It's still a public cloud. It's a multi-tenant cloud. And if you have specific requirements that say you can't do that, if you have regulations that say you can't do that, those are things you need to be careful of. Even if you're a small business, um, you still need to understand what your legal requirements are. And so if you have any restrictions there, then that might make the decision for you. Um, if you don't have any of those restrictions, you can pretty much do whatever you want. If the cloud makes a lot of sense. You know, I mean, if, if you are going to have to manage on-premises infrastructure wholly for this, and it's, it's a lot, and it's a lot for you to manage, it's going to be costly, there is something to be said for moving to a public cloud uh, server, software as a service solution like this. Um, you know, pay for what you are consuming in terms of mailbox load. You get a lot of great features. You get a lot of great innovation because everything moves very quickly there. Um, you know, understand your risks when you're doing that. So it's not always rosy on-prem or in the cloud. So, you know, if you're in the cloud, Make sure you understand your dependency on that cloud provider being up. So making sure you're choosing a good cloud provider if you're looking at Microsoft or other ones. Um, making sure you understand your dependency on your internet connection for mailbox access and, and internal mail flow, things like that. Um, but we see a, a lot of our smaller clients in the past typically were very reluctant to move to uh, software as a service cloud. They're moving a lot more aggressively nowadays because they've gotten a lot more comfortable with it. I suspect that trend will continue to move. So it's really just a question for you know each client to look at that cost benefit. Usually the cost is skewed very heavily in the cloud in terms of initial investment because you've got that capital you've got to expend for an on-premises solution. Um, but ongoing operations, that's where things might become a little gray because there's a little subjectivity in terms of what's more efficient for you to manage it in the cloud or, or on-premises. But you know there's great solutions out there, I think. So um, we definitely see a lot of clients moving there. Great. Thanks for picking that up. Sorry, I'd actually missed that one. I'd, sorry about that. Um, 
So with that being said, it, it really does look like that uh, the Twitter has calmed down and I'm not getting really any more questions in the question pane. So thanks again, guys, for hopping on and discussing this with us. Uh, you know, anybody that's out there, you know, if you get you know somebody who hasn't seen it or you want to re look at this, um, we'll have the recording up here probably in the next in a couple of days or so, and it'll be up there and posted. And thanks again for everybody joining and presenting to the masses. Yeah, thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. Like I said, listen many times. First time I'm actually presenting. Hopefully not the last. So I hope it's not. VMworld. Yeah, I'll see everybody at VMworld. I'm, on, I'm presenting on that uh, the VM Underground that we talked about early, and then I've got a session on uh, virtualizing Active Directory. So hope to see you there. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks, guys. Really appreciate them. You know, first time listener and first time uh, participant. So I'm really happy about it. Glad to see we got a lot of people turn out. And a lot of people stick past the end of it. That's awesome. I will also be at VMworld. I'll be in the back of Matt's session heckling him, so you can look for me there. I've got one important question for you. Are you going to get on Twitter more? Yeah. <laughs> Did Maddie put you up to that? <laughs> no, I've, we've just been seeing the stream. We've been kind of telling people follow you, man. No. Yeah, I, I will try. I mean, I, I always try and find time for it, but it usually eludes me. But I will definitely try. Okay. All right. Well, I've, thank I've, you, guys. Guys, I've, I've been trying to get Joe active on Twitter for three or four years, so it's figure if we can get him 20 or 30 extra followers in a night, maybe he would say, well, there's value in this. We'll see what ah, he did. He should probably, he'll probably have a bump. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. I'm going to go ahead and close this out for the evening.